Okay. Hello there, this is Kendo Nagasaki, Peter Thornley, the man behind the mask, and I am watching Cheap Shot Entertainment this afternoon and, and this morning and tonight. Hope you all join me. Bye! Promotional consideration paid for by the following. <laughs> This is awesome! Hello and welcome once again to another retro review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. We are moving on now to the October show for 2003, which is No Mercy. And it is the sixth edition of No Mercy in the No Mercy series. And it is from the Royal Farms Arena, Baltimore Arena, First Marina, First Mariner Arena in Baltimore, Maryland. Obviously, it's a change of name since this event took place. It is a SmackDown exclusive and a smaller crowd than this one at 8,500 fans packed into the arena with the main event of the show being Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker. And this would be a rivalry that would span quite some way into uh, recreating The Undertaker, rebirthing The Undertaker, so to speak. <clears throat> um, so you can obviously find the pay-per-view on the WWE Network, hashtag 999. And it took place on October 19th, 2003, with the... Pay-per-view being around three hours long and the theme song being Today is the Day by Dope. Um, with the game also featuring in... Uh, sorry, not the game. With the arena also featuring in the games. WWE Smackdown vs Raw for PlayStation and Xbox and WWE Day of Reckoning for the GameCube. Just before we get into the main part of the podcast and reviewing the main matches on the main card, we have to do the pre-show, the Sunday Night Heat, or as you would know it now, the kickoff show. It is Billy Kidman versus Shannon Moore in a cruiserweight division match. And it is Billy Kidman who defeats Shannon Moore. Which would lead us into the first match, which is actually for the Cruiserweight Championship. But, before we get there, please like and subscribe. And after the introduction, I hope you're still with us. Because we'll go through all the events of WWE No Mercy 2003. And so, on to our first match of the evening... It is the WWE Cruiserweight Championship that is on the line featuring Tejiri, the reigning defending champion against the master of the 619, Rey Mysterio. And Rey Mysterio was really new to WWE at this point. Tejiri had been around for a couple of years, but these two are absolute veterans and no matter what kind of Situation you put them in, they will be entertaining and entertaining they were. The big story going into this, of course, is that Tajiri would do Mr McMahon's dirty work and uh, use the black mist on Nidia and uh, obviously Jamie Noble, uh, very concerned about that. The story being told here is that Nidia is possibly <clears throat> blind from the attack. <clears throat> but, like I say, with wrestling, you have to suspend your disbelief and uh, just go along with the story. It would it would play out a little bit later down the line, of course, um, with uh, Nidia and Jamie Noble, although I'm not quite sure what the foresight to that was, being that Jamie Noble was basically a heel, um, so maybe I need to watch SmackDown from you know the, the SmackDown before to get an idea of that. But lo and behold, 
we just do the pay-per-view. So, this match, if you want to look at cruiserweights in WWE and want some good cruiserweight competition, um, yes, the cruiserweight classic is brilliant. The second one is really good as well. I think there was a second one. Yes, there were. Yes, there was. Were. Yes, there was a second one. Um, and... Like I say, really good. They should bring those tournaments back. They were really, really good and a good way to scout competition, good way to scout um, new talent and stuff like that. Anyway, Cruiserweight 2003. Really, really hot. They, This match wasn't really a high-flying contest. You've got two contrasting styles here, as alluded to by Michael Cole and Taz with Rey Mysterio being more of a high flyer and Tajiri being more grounded with the strikes. So it does tell the story as you go through. Rey Mysterio tries to take out the legs of Tajiri. Tajiri tries to take the legs out from Mysterio because both guys use those in different ways. Tajiri with the strikes, Rey Mysterio with the leaping ability. Um, it would be... That it would be a slow start, um, both guys feeling, feeling it out and seeing where it went. Um, they would end up on the outside. They roll back in, and then the match sort sort of starts getting starts picking up and starts getting a bit more, uh, physical. Like I say, the big story here is the mist. Tajiri's been using that quite a bit and used it to gain the championship originally. So the referee did check the mouth of Tajiri before the start of this match, which is fine, because obviously the big story being told there. And Rey Mysterio would show his vertical leaping ability by getting thrown into the corner, but leaping up onto the top rope and then spinning round and doing a crossbody for a near fall. We go into the last part of the match with the... Uh, Tajiri then going for the kick to the head, Rey Mysterio ducking it and uh, tripping um, Tajiri up with the single leg takedown and monkey flipping him into the second rope for the 619 which would hit. We then get the West Coast pop and the referee was almost there and then two overzealous fans jump in the ring. Or are they? Answers on a postcard. Either way, you should never jump in the ring. I've been on a show where the where a, a child got uh, really into it and jumped in the ring and tried to save his hero. But at the same time, it's very dangerous. Very dangerous. So don't ever think about doing that if you're at a show. The uh, guys and girls are very highly trained professional athletes and... What they do in the ring is and can be very dangerous. But you don't need to tell me that because WWE tell you that all the time. Anyway, that would be the end of the match because Rey Mysterio would be distracted by the two uh, crowd members. Even though they were both wearing suits, they would get chucked out. And um, Tajiri would then hit the spin kick to the back of the head, Rey Mysterio would be out and Tajiri would get the victory and retain the championship. Who are these two mystery people? Because I don't think they're fans. And if I remember rightly, I remember rightly. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this match is really good. Really, really good. And it's a great way to start the show, get a decent amount of time. I'm going to go straight in on this one. I'm going to give it a four cheap shots out of five. Really, really enjoyable match from two absolute veterans. We move into the back. Vince McMahon is ascending the stairs. He is interrupted by Josh Matthews, who asks him how he's feeling about his match against his own daughter. He says it's tearing him up inside, and he says it's a stupid question. How could he even ask that question? He doesn't want to do it, but he feels like he has to do it. And then we move on to the next match. 
move on to the next match, which features the rabid Wolverine Chris Benoit versus the man with a bowling ball sized head in Albert or A Train as he is known at this point in time. Now, these two are huge in stature at this point in time. The uh, A-Train recently went against The Undertaker at WrestleMania. A bit of a rub there. And <clears throat> uh, came up on the losing side, obviously, because The Undertaker was still on his streak. But he's been uh, on a bit of a tear and doing Vince McMahon's dirty work on SmackDown, of course. So... He's going against Chris Benoit, the rabid Wolverine, before he went crazy and did things he did. He was really good. And I've said this on many, many videos. He is one of the best technical wrestlers to ever grace the squared circle, despite what he did outside the ring. Coming from the uh, Stu Hart Dungeon Wrestling School. And... This match is really good. It's two contrasting styles. A-Train, obviously, with the size and the power, but Chris Benoit also has his own power. He's got a short wheelbase, if you like, and he can use all of that momentum to move the big man around. And some of the stuff that went off is just incredible. Benoit... Um, would eventually win with a sharpshooter after being dropped on his head on a chair. Uh, it would be several years, so to speak, before he did what he did, but that looked nasty, and he went straight down on top of his head. Not many people that could get up from that, apart from Chris Benoit, and he still got up and finished the match. You could tell there was concern from the referee and from his opponent, take it out of kayfabe, um, as A-Train went for the choke um, to uh, you know, fill in the gaps. But Chris Benoit would <coughs> eventually get the triple uh, three amigos, the triple um, German suplexes, on a train which is absolutely incredible and get the uh, triple cross face in which is countered by the a train but it would soon be that chris benoit would have a train on his back fighting like a, a turtle that couldn't get up and straight into the sharpshooter and a train would have no answer for this so your winner by submission in this match is Chris Benoit um, in a non-traditional way for his character. And that's pretty cool because, you know, it's a different move, but it still shows homage to where he's from, which is awesome. And continuing along those lines, I'm giving this one four cheap shots out of five because it is a really, really good match. And uh, the show shows no sign of stopping at this point in time either with how things are going. So we move on now and it uh, seems like Heidenreich is having a bit of a spat with Shannon Moore, the little MFer, And Matt Hardy comes along and says, you know what, it was a tape of Shannon Moore's best matches. It wasn't very long so we managed to watch it and chuck it away. It wasn't Heidenreich's tape. Heidenreich wants the tape to show to John Laurinaitis so he can get a contract with WWE. Um, and we move on to the next match, which is indeed Matt Hardy, along with the little mf -er Shannon Moore. That is Mattitude follower and nothing else. And uh, they come down to the ring and uh, the, their opponent, his opponent, Matt Hardy is Zach Gowan, the literal one-legged guy in an ass-kicking contest. Um, amazing, amazing athlete. Um, do you think he was... Well, actually, he was booked pretty well, to be fair. It could have been like a sideshow, like when they had the um, Little Wrestlers back in 1994. Um, like an attraction type thing, but... 
no, they thinking about it. They booked him really quite well, even though he came up on the losing uh, on. Well, okay, he came up winning um, against Vince McMahon, and uh, you know he was um, billed quite well. I mean, he is a good athlete, but there's always going to be issues when you've only got one leg, and. To be fair, he holds it really well. And if anybody was going to be in his first singles match, it would be Matt Hardy who can hold a five-star or, in the case of Wrestling Observer, seven stars matches with a bin bag, then you've got, um, you know, you've got a good formula here. Obviously, Shannon Moore does get involved at several points. But uh, Zach Gowan... Manages to come out on top on this one. Beautiful moonsault for the win. Um, taking Paige out of Matt Hardy's book. Who would miss a moonsault earlier on in the match. Which would be the turning point. And from there, Zach Gowan managed to um, do everything. They usually does the drop kicks and things. So, you know, it it is quite spectacular. Which is really good. And it was quite entertaining what it was and wasn't a very long match but it was decent and I'm going to give this two cheap shots out of five um, just because there obviously are limitations of what Zach Gowan could do and it kind of did show in this match but it was still incredible knowing that he could do that and it really as a kid made you believe that um, these things could happen. I say as a kid in 2003, I was 21. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is it is what it is, isn't it? But we move on to a backstage segment with Vince McMahon chilling out in his chair. Who should arrive? None other than his wife, or then wife, Linda McMahon to challenge him about his match against Stephanie. And he's still very defiant because he's Vince McMahon, damn it. And that's what he does. We move on to the next match. And we move on to the next match, which is a tag team match between the Basham brothers and the APA, of course, Farouk and Bradshaw coming all the way from the Attitude Era and into the ruthless aggression era. So this uh, does have a storyline behind it as well. Um, the Bashams and the APA have been at each other's throats for a couple of weeks with the APA first attacking the Basham brothers, Basham brothers uh, coming back with an attack where uh, the APA did um, take out Shaniqua, who is the manager for the Basham brothers, um, who uh, got taken out by a clothesline from hell from Bradshaw. So that's when the Bashams did come back and uh, you know avenge their manager, so to speak. So um, yeah, the um, Bashams are without Shaniqua here. The storyline is that she's on the shelf and. Uh, yeah, it's it's an okay match actually. Um I think the Bashams were saddled with characters that were very much a fantasy of Vince McMahon. Uh, and that's unfortunately where <laughs> where the, where this goes because even though um it was even though it was a, a, an okay match, it wasn't memorable in any way, really. Uh, and it would be the APA who would have the bulk of this match um, with Bradshaw and Farouk just panning the Basham brothers for most of it. Uh, until Shaniqua made her return with a big stick and uh, would take out for Farouk for the Basham brothers to pin and get the win from. So, um, 
well-timed interference this definitely well-timed interference from uh, the Basham's manager uh, it seems that Shaniqua has had some work done shall we say and in a turn of poor taste and this is why I say it's a, uh, a Vince McMahon fancy they cut a promo after the match where Shaniqua says that the clothesline from hell made her chest swell uh, and the Bashams are salivating over it. The whole thing with the Bashams and Shaniqua is that Shaniqua is their mistress and uh, they're going to celebrate by, I don't know, going back to the dungeon or something like that. I don't, I, you know, um, only uh, things that uh, don't appear on TV. Maybe in the Attitude Era, GTV would have had a camera in there, but it is beyond me. Anyway, the, um, yeah, very tasteless promo um, after the reasonably good match. So I'm going to give this one two cheap shots out of five. It wasn't a barnstormer, but you've got the uh, experience of the APA able to carry the Bashams through to a decent match with good structure and and plenty of things to like about like about it in the terms of tag team wrestling which is one of my favorite things tag team wrestling when it's done properly so yeah like i say two cheap shots out of five for this one and i've already gone through what the promo was as well because i needed to get that uh, that little tidbit out of the way let's move on to the next match so the next match on the card at No Mercy is the father versus daughter match in an I quit match. The aim of this match is to make your opponent say I quit. And the storyline here is that Stephanie won't quit Smackdown, but her father, Vince McMahon, wants her to leave and quit gracefully. She wouldn't do it. Therefore, the match has been made. Now... Stephanie McMahon would be accompanied to the ring by her mother and then wife of Vince McMahon, Linda. And of course, Vince McMahon being accompanied to the ring by his mistress and Mrs. Brock Lesnar, currently Sable. And uh, you know what? For what this match is, it was quite entertaining. Uh, for two non-wrestlers to put on a match like this is an incredible ask but what they lacked in technical ability they gave into storytelling and that was the thing that drew me in with this match it was all about the story now Stephanie obviously giving up a lot of poundage to her father and Vince is looking ripped at this point in time, as he always does. Stephanie um, is a lot younger, um, more able to uh, take the bumps and things like that, which is which is good. And bumps there were. They were basic, but they worked. And they were sold really well. Like, it was a... David versus Goliath scenario. Vince was never going, going to go away without making his daughter quit Smackdown. But it was, in fact, no words that came out of Stephanie McMahon's mouth. It was, in fact, a steel pipe that came into play a lot in this match. There wasn't a lot of weapons at all. A steel pipe was the only discernible weapon here in this match taking out Vince's grapefruits um, to some extent but obviously when you've got balls the size of grapefruits they're quite hard to crack um, and they could not crack his nuts last of the crap jokes anyway um, yeah it wouldn't have a lot of effect Vince would get the upper hand here as uh, Linda would look on at her daughter being choked out by her own husband 
and the father of Stephanie McMahon with the steel pipe. Obviously, the referee could do nothing. Stephanie was incapacitated, could not say the words I quit and would not say the words I quit. And therefore, Linda takes the uh, initiative here, picks up the white towel and throws it into the ring. Thus, making Vince McMahon the winner of this match. Um, it is a case of, like I say, size versus um, willingness. And it was always going to end this way when it became an I Quit match. As much as I love Stephanie McMahon, she wasn't going to come across as a figure that could beat Vince in an I Quit match, regardless of what she managed to pull out of the bag regarding her uh, tenure as SmackDown general manager. Now, I thought she did a fantastic job. Uh, WWE at this point in time, especially SmackDown, was absolutely buzzing. And um, this storyline was a bit of a shock to me when I first saw it. But, um, you know, everyone needs time away and it was a good thing. So I'm going to give this match a two and a half cheap shots out of five. Like I say, it was never going to be a catch a catch can classic. It was never going to have um, super kicks and and uh, moon salts and all that other stuff. It just told a really compelling story, and that is a big part of wrestling. The storytelling is huge, and. Often you can get a good match out of storytelling. And that is how they did it here. So your winner in this match, father versus daughter, is father Vince McMahon. The next match on the card is the first big marquee match. It is John Cena, the Doctor of Thugonomics, back when he was the street thug. The play-by-play -play calls are all calling him a street fighter. And he's going against Kurt Angle, a match with a lot of history. Of course, John Cena making his debut against Kurt Angle when he ushered in the era of ruthless aggression. <clears throat> but, unlike what you may think, this match is quite even and it is actually Really entertaining, good match. Um, shows that um, over time that John Cena had just been put in a position where he didn't need to do very much, but the fact that he could do it again, a bit green, but as long as there's a story being told, I'm hooked. And the story here was power of John Cena, the street fighting ability of John Cena versus. The catch as catch can uh, amateur wrestling background of Kurt Angle. And John Cena here is trading holds with Kurt Angle, you know, hold for hold, blow for blow. I and mean, there's quite a lot of uh, bits in here in the match where John Cena is actually taking Kurt Angle down to the mat. He's not as green as he is, cabbage looking, when it comes to. The mat wrestling, but obviously Kurt Angle knows how to get in and out of all holds that John Cena puts on him. There's several near falls where you think, oh my goodness, John Cena is actually going to pin the Olympic gold medalist. Uh, Kurt Angle does a good job of creating that attention, kicking out at two and nine tenths several times after a, an FU as it were as it was called at that point um, and all of John Cena's top moves including a buckle bomb that looked absolutely just so dangerous and painful that it was um, you know he was on the cusp but obviously Kurt Angle is a consummate professional and can take those kind of moves but the call here was the surgically repaired neck, of course, going against 
<clears throat> Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 19. He has only just come back from that surgically repaired neck. Uh, you know, from the neck surgery and the and being out for a little while after that match, and uh, the the commentary here is almost like an extra part of the story because it's so good. Michael Cole and Taz don't get enough credit when it comes to the commentary side of matches, and I always think you know you can have a really good match, but the commentary always adds to it, especially when you're watching it on TV. And this match was no different. <clears throat> I was really impressed with John Cena and there's a reason that I did actually follow John Cena round about this time because he was actually pretty decent. He was still getting his look. He still had the wrestling boots rather than the trainers, but obviously that would come with time and it wouldn't be too long before uh, John Cena would pick up that main championship, of course. But Kurt Angle... Still knocking around the championship picture at this point. John Cena done has done everything he can to make people take notice. And take notice they did. Like I said, this is the first of the night where it's a big marquee match. We've had a couple of matches that feature sort of non-wrestlers and things like that. But this one, really, really good. I'm going to give it four and a half cheap shots out of five after... Kurt Angle picks up the victory by getting out of another FU, picking the leg, rolling Cena up into an ankle lock. Cena battles out and uh, tries to get to the ropes. Kurt Angle locks in the ankle lock even further with the leg grapevine. And uh, John Cena has nowhere else to go. Taps out. Kurt Angle wins. Like I said, this one gets four cheap shots out of five. <clears throat> so moving on now to um, the second big marquee match. It features Eddie Guerrero, the current reigning and defending United States champion, going against the largest athlete in the world known as the Big Show. And now they did show a nice little hype package for this and I'd completely forgotten all the antics that Eddie Guerrero went to to... Uh, get the upper hand and really get into the head of the big show here, including, but not limited to, driving a cess truck. And by cess truck, I mean a truck that sucks out the poo from toilets <laughs> um, into the arena and spraying the big show with it. Um Obviously, I don't think it was, but it looked nasty and, um, yeah, it was pretty horrid. Um, the Big Show would retaliate a week later by smashing Eddie Guerrero into the bonnet of his own custom car. Or at least his borrowed custom car. I hope they paid to fix whatever damage the Big Show did because the attack was... Everything the Big Show should be. Um, ruthless, aggressive, just nasty and just aiming to maim and destroy uh, Eddie Guerrero in that attack. Including choke slamming him on the hood as well as the roof of the car. Um, also of note here in that attack... Big Show punched the windscreen and broke it. Um, so you, you don't want to underestimate the power that the Big Show actually has in those hands. So <clears throat> we go on to the match. Obviously the psychology, the games have been played here. Uh, Eddie Guerrero does get an early start on the Big Show. Knowing that if he lets the Big Show in... He's probably going to lose this match. Uh, Big Show comes back um, using all of his strength and his power. There's a point where uh, the referee gets taken out um, with a frog splash from Eddie Guerrero. On Oh, no, it wasn't a frog splash. It was a pure kick out. It was a weightlifting kick out from Big Show uh, from a pin. It lands on the referee's back. Uh, Big Show gets up immediately, tries to drop a leg 
on to Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero moves out of the way and Nick Patrick takes the leg drop as well, <laughs> which was hilarious. Um, so with the referee out, this gives leeway for um, Eddie Guerrero to lie, cheat and steal his way to a victory. He brings out the brass knuckles and hits Big Show, gets a near fall, brings out the title belt, hits Big Show, gets a near fall. Unfortunately for Eddie Guerrero, this would be his downfall as he would succumb to the power of Big Show. All that lying, cheating and stealing did him no good in this match at all. Big Show pins Eddie Guerrero and we have a new United States heavyweight champion. The the title here looks so tiny. It looks like a toy on the Big Show. Tries to put it around his waist. Can't do it. Uh, obviously, the Big Show would carry the title all the way to WrestleMania, uh, where he would go against John Cena uh, at WrestleMania 20. So, <clears throat> yeah, Big Show wins. This match is actually pretty decent. I'm going to give it three and a half cheap shots out of five. And we're going to move on now to our main event, which is the biker chain match between Undertaker and Brock Lesnar. And on to the main event of No Mercy 2003. It is for the Undisputed Championship, or the WWE Championship, as it would become, between Brock Lesnar, the current reigning defending champion, and the dead man, The Undertaker, and is a biker chain match. So in this match, a chain is hanging from the corner of the ring on a pole. And the person who can climb up to that said chain and grab it uh, can then use the chain. Only thing is, obviously, if they lose the chain, the other person can grab it as well. So always baffled me why someone would want to stop someone else from grabbing that chain. Because you could just sort of duck it and give them a kick and then get the chain and use it. But it adds to the drama, of course. And uh, Brock Lesnar, Undertaker, had a storied rivalry over the years. And um, obviously culminating in... Uh, 2014 with WrestleMania 30 and that infamous win, um, the shocked Taker guy. So, obviously, with a younger Taker and a very young Brock Lesnar, these two are absolutely at the top of their game at this point in time, and it absolutely shows throughout this match. Brock Lesnar um, wanting to use his power, but obviously The Undertaker also has the power. The um, Undertaker has the experience, whereas Brock Lesnar has the quickness as well. So it starts off Undertaker backing Brock into a corner. Brock moves out of the way, does that a couple of times. Uh, Brock Lesnar then tries to get the upper hand on The Undertaker, but Undertaker comes back, knocks him out of the ring. He's getting frustrated at this point. Um, and, uh, yeah, the uh, chain wouldn't come into play until later on in the match, and that would be after uh, interference from the full-blooded Ita blooded Italians or the FBI. And uh, uh, Nunzio, Johnny Stamboli and Chuck Palumbo. Um, who would come down and seemingly help Brock Lesnar after the lights were mysteriously turned out and stopping The Undertaker from grabbing the chain. One thing here is that Nunzio tries to go and grab the chain, but he's not quite tall enough even on the top rope, um, which leads to The Undertaker giving him a last ride. Uh, Brock Lesnar would also take a last ride before the end of the match, but unfortunately the referee would be knocked out at this point in time as well, um, leading to a very close near fall when he was revived by The Undertaker after said uh, last ride. And um, we also see The Undertaker fly over the top rope and uh, 
land on the FBI taking them out in this match as well, which is always a sight to see when you see a dead man fly, and it is absolutely awesome. So we move on to the finish of the match. The chair is brought into play. There's no rules in this match, of course, because the chain is um, is available. Or no real rules, anyway. Uh, Vince McMahon would rear his ugly head after making his own daughter say I quit. Although she didn't say I quit, Linda McMahon threw in the towel. Um, after beating up his own daughter, he would come down and cost The Undertaker the win in this biker chain match. Uh, with Brock Lesnar hitting the F5 for the win after the distract distraction and the use of the chair. Uh, obviously, Undertaker is pissed at this point in time because he's just had the championship stolen from him by his own boss. Um, but this match is really good and a very fitting end to the show. Uh, really picked up towards the end of this match and thusly towards the end of the show as well. In a show that was probably mediocre at best, the last three matches were quite good um, and, and carried the whole show, apart from a few others. But... I'm going to give this match a four cheap shots out of five. It's not perfect because of the stipulation, which is quite weird, it, it, but it makes sense in wrestling, I suppose. Um, so, yes, the uh, chain did come into play, but it would be Brock Lesnar that would grab that and, and use it and eventually have all the help that he needed, making Brock look quite weak but Undertaker, a very real and credible contender, still going forward. Uh, of course, that would be buried uh, a, a, a month later. But uh, overall, yeah, it was a decent, decent pay-per-view. 2003 was okay um, in terms of pay-per-views, and uh, this one was no different. This SmackDown exclusive. Obviously, Brock Lesnar retained, like I say, four cheap shots out of five, and overall... The show was very enjoyable. So we move on to the next outing for WWE in 2003. And that would be the Survivor Series. One of the big four. Uh, which has now become the big five with Money in the Bank as well. Um, and it is a good Survivor Series if I remember rightly. With a couple of really good marquee matches as well as the Survivor Series matches. Now, I always think of Survivor Series as one of those pay-per-views where you can do dangerous matches because it's a Survivor Series. And the actual Survivor Series match is something that always should be on this card. Otherwise, just change the name and drop the Survivor Series. But yes, we'll move on to Survivor Series 2003. I hope you will join us there. And I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. And I will see you again next time. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>